This is the 2 p.m. time slot on um, Monday, and we've had a speaker cancellation. So we're going to turn this into an open mic time, and everybody that's got a favorite project, a favorite idea, um, and it can be anything you want. It can be radical. Don't worry about it, and you can have 10 minute time slot. And we're going to start you out with our first guy. Introduce yourself, and tell what your topic is, and go for it. My name is James M. Ray, and the topic is energy from thorium. A lot of other people know a lot more about this than I do, and I encourage everyone to go to YouTube and, uh, and look at Energy from Thorium, which is one of the Thorium Energy Alliance. Those are two good channels on it. But for this kind of a crowd, I'll start with just saying, would it surprise you if the government had gotten clean energy right in the early 1970s and then totally defunded it? Well, they defunded it apparently for a number of reasons. There's, there's a lot of inertia in the nuclear business. And once that uh, first nuclear reactor actually worked and, and powered a submarine, everyone got really excited about using that exact technology, which is really, really filthy and really makes a lot of waste and really inefficient, but good for powering submarines. They got really excited about doing that. And the guy who invented that reactor, his name is Alvin Weinberg, and he got excited. He thought his reactor had some inherent safety issues. So even though it was good for submarines, and with Hyman Rickover's really good submarine crews, they were really able to, to do relatively safe submarines. I mean, you know, it hasn't been perfect record of safety. But this guy, Alvin Weinberg, decided how we should do fission is not as precision machined uh, pellets that are in zirconium tubes, but instead in a liquid medium of molten salt. And if things get too hot, toss in some more salt. If things really get too hot, the idea behind the molten salt reactor is that it's a giant reactor vessel, but as long as gravity is working, you got a pump to get everything out of there. And so at the bottom of the reactor vessel, the thing that excites people like me is that everyone can die, all the power can go off, you can have a Chernobyl or you know Fukushima type of reaction, and this thing, a kink in the hose at the bottom with a fan blowing on it, the fan goes off because the power goes off, and the plug in the bottom of the tank melts, and then the reactor's contents go off and passively cool, and as long as gravity keeps working, this works. So you're not relying on diesel pumps and you know, the things that have failed us before, and you're, you're in an inherently safer reaction anyway because it's, you're not having to constantly replace these tubes, you're instead constantly having to pull certain reactor products, but they're valuable, off of this thing. And one of them is xenon, which really screws with, with normal reactors, but in a liquid medium it's kind of easy to pull the gas off. And a few of the others are really exciting. I'm from Florida. And uh, the reason we have things like the Voyager um, spacecraft and the, uh, the Vikings and all the, the, the Mars uh, Explorer, the, the Mars Curiosity, I guess they call it, the Curiosity has like 4.2 pounds of a really, really weird compound called plutonium-238. Now, the kind of plutonium in, in atomic bombs is plutonium-239, and it's completely different. Plutonium-238 won't make a really good bomb, although it's really toxic. But it's this red hot stuff that stays hot, red hot, and radioactive hot, but it's easy to shield against for about 90 something years or something like that. And during that time, you can run a spacecraft like the Voyager for amazing distances. You know, we've, we've seen them reprogram Voyager and do great things with Voyager with really 1970s technology. And all of this stuff, okay, for the last couple of missions, where we got it was not from our own reactors because the, the light water reactors don't make it very well. <laughs> Lifters, the, the, the molten reactor makes it really well. The light water reactors don't make this stuff really well, so we bought it from the Russians and we bought it from various other people, but everybody's running out of it because it's hard to make in, a, in the normal, in your father's reactors. It's really kind of easy to make in this reactor, and this is one of the only, only long live reactor products that comes out of it, and by long live I mean 100 years. Some of the other stuff that this reactor can do, in addition to making power, 
It can solve the water problem in a lot of the world. You know, we're sucking water out, out of the aquifers at huge rates, and it's probably unsustainable. And there are areas of the world, like the Middle East, where people are fighting, they say it's about oil, but it's also about water. And if fresh water becomes cheap and pretty easily available, it might actually end so much war. There's still gonna be war, I'm pessimistic about that, but maybe not so damn much war, you know, just a little bit less, a little bit less murder. <laughs> and um, aside from that, the light water reactors that we have, let's say we shut them all down tomorrow like the Germans stupidly did, okay, their light water reactor waste from 30 years of running these 30 year old and now obsolete reactors is not going to go away. The waste isn't going to magically disappear when you stop making it. It's going to be there and you're going to have to do something with it. One of the things you can do with it instead of spending a lot of money by burying it in a mountain is burn it in one of these liquid fluoride thorium reactors. You just toss it in and wait till enough neutrons hit it for it to get hot and burn. And with this, with this molten salt, they heat other salt that then they use to, to run turbines. And they can run the turbines more efficiently than we run turbines now with, um, with steam. It, it's much more efficient if you can have seven or 800 degree salt. And with this process heat, they call it process heat, you can have industrial heat without ever bothering to convert it to electricity. If you just have a plant near the, the lifter, you know, you can pull off some of the salt loop, you know, after they've gotten some power from it, and there's still enough left for, you know, 500 degree heat for you to make whatever you need to make. And so it, it's a win-win situation compared to the kind of nuclear reactors we have now. Is it proliferation safe? Not entirely, but compared to a light water reactor, it's totally safe. You, the first step in a light water reactor is you're going to hit a uranium-238 with a neutron, and it's going to end up go fishing in, into plutonium-239 through this process. That it's, it's a chain, but anyway, it's a bad thing. You don't want bad people having plutonium-239. The, proce the process in the lifter makes uranium-233, and this, while you can, while it can be fissile, it's not fertile. Thorium's fertile, so if you hit it with a neutron, it'll become fissile it, through a few steps. This fissile stuff that it makes, uranium-233, is different than the stuff we mine. We mine uranium-235 for these expensive, like, obsolete light water reactors we have now, and it's a rare like platinum. Thorium is common. It's not quite lead, but it's pretty common stuff in the, in the earth, so there's, there's no resource problem with this. You can have this reactor, and once you get this reactor started with a, a fissile load, the fertile stuff takes care of it. It keeps going. So it's very hard to actually scoop out a bomb's worth of material, even if you wanted to. And generally, if a bad person gets a reactor, a bomb's going to happen, a bad thing's going to happen. You know, the point is that, you know, this process, if you really care about the Earth, and if you look at solar and you look at wind and realize that they just don't have the energy density necessary for, you know, places like Africa and South America and Haiti and all these places where people are really poor, if we really want to bring up people from poverty and end war, we have to solve the resource problem, the energy problem, the right way. And the right way is vision. It's so much more energy dense than anything else and that it's weird that we're not using it, and it's weird that we're not using it right. Anyway, I'll take questions if my time isn't up. My time's probably up, right? No, no, you, you spoke so fast. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, it's But this is a terrible talk. Look, the good talks are on YouTube. You should not even put this on YouTube, okay? Two more minutes. All right, well, if anybody has any questions. Yes. Wasn't it true early on that the military was looking for nuclear reactors to even power airplanes? That's how they came about this. Yeah, okay. Alvin Weinberg, thank you for reminding me this, this, this part of the story. Alvin Weinberg's group at Oak Ridge was proving, it was doing this, and the Air Force and the Navy and the Army are kind of three separate competing, um, competing bureaucracies. And the Air Force bureaucracy at that point had just gotten intercontinental ballistic missiles, and they'd just gotten really, really accurate with them too, and because they'd just gotten a bunch of German scientists. So anyway, they, they were really happy with ballistic missiles, and the Navy's sitting there, well, we've got diesel submarines, but we don't really have, you know, and, and then they have the nuclear submarines, but, um, oh, they had the nuclear submarines first, and then the missiles. Until the missiles, the Air Force wanted a plane with a reactor in it, though, which is a crazy idea. And Weinberg explained that it was a crazy idea, but they still knew that there was a government budget behind it. And they knew that this kind of a reactor could do other things. And it's still, the because the regulatory structure in the U.S. is such that it's really terrible, the Chinese are probably likely to be the first people to do this reactor. Or the U.S. Navy secretly, because neither the Chinese nor the U.S. Navy have to deal with 
the EPA and the NRC and all these other bureaucracies. Yeah. But a lot of these bureaucracies and a lot of these people, you can become a nuclear engineer and know nothing about it. No, nothing about liquid fluoride thorium reactors and nothing about the weird experiment that, thank you for reminding me. <laughs> Anyways, I'll stop if you got another person. Uh, no, one more question. Uh, okay. There's this guy named Kurt. Is it Kurt? I've Kirk Sorensen. Kirk. Probably. He's, he's, he's my inspiration. The, what's the name of his video that people can watch online? Um, you know what you want to do, and this is like four hours of video, but if you go to www.thoriumremix, T H O R I U M R E M I X.com, one more, Thorium Remix. If you go to that video, that website, that has a bunch of, of YouTube videos, including a video with. Um, with a recording of Richard Nixon himself saying, be ruthless, which is entertaining enough if you're as old as we are, right? <laughs> yeah. All right, thanks. Thank you. Okay, so our next guy is Nick Ford. Hi, everybody. Um, let me move this thing. There we go. Hi. Um, today, I'm going to talk about um, a topic that I actually was thinking about just doing myself in place in the whole talk, but I'm glad we did this because it's so rough that uh, I don't know how well it'll go over. But anyway, so I'm going to try to intertwine this with libertarianism. Um, so this is a Marvel superhero uh, named Squirrel Girl, and um, basically she's my, this is my favorite comic right now, it's called The Unbeatable Squirrel Girl. And um, a lot of the ways that she defeats um, criminals or villains in the comic book is that they often underestimate her, or that she often um, gets a lot of attacks on, and like they, they don't really notice it. So I was trying to intertwine that with sort of like the idea of death by a thousand cuts, uh, or small cuts, depends on how you see the sentence, but um, this idea that um, to challenge the state in a very, um, uh, so I'm an anarchist, spoilers, um, but um, to, to challenge the state in a very sort of uh, organized or effective method, um, one thing that we have to do is it's not always so bad to be underground because um, certainly less people, you know, it'll involve less media, less networking, uh, people will be less aware of what you're doing. Um, but there's also sort of a perceptibility challenge. Um, the, one of the things that James C. Scott, who talks about um, the legibility of the state, the state tries to make everything in society very legible, very clear, understood. Um, they can um, calculate it, um, put it into methods and stuff like that. Um, if we can sort of counter that um, tendency of the state and we can ride around that, um, we become a lot more formidable because we can be a lot more fluid in our, our sort of reaction time to, the, to whatever the state does because the state's always trying to put a magnifying glass on us and see what we're doing. They're trying to regulate, control, um, and basically, you know, boss us around. Um, so one thing to, to sort of combat this is to develop these networks of um, sort of organizations that can inflict these small little sort of openings in the state's weaknesses. Um, it's called like a system punk, basically, like the weak point of a given system. And the idea is basically to exploit the sort of central vulnerabilities in the state's uh, capacity. Because the state, after all, is only made out of uh, people. It's only made up of individuals just like us. They're not special, they don't have any special magical authority that gives them the right to rule over other people. Um, you know, they're no more qualified than most other people, at least I think. Um, certainly, they're, low, they're pretty um, consistent, low uh, approval ratings proves that. Um, there's another thing that I think that's interesting from Squirrel Girl that's kind of like um, sort of the alternative way of mediating uh, or dealing with crime which is that instead of going the Batman route where you tor torture the criminal until they confess, then you throw them in jail and then they get out two months later and start killing people again, because that's what always happens. Um, uh, you basically like get to the root of what causes crime to begin with. Um, so in one of the, one of the comics of the Medieval Squirrel Girl, she, um, there's this uh, character called the, the Hippo Man, and as you would guess, it's an anthropomorphic hippo who has a crazy amount of strength, and he's basically trying to rob a bank. And she's like, why are you doing this? And he's like, well, I, no, I got forced into turning into, I got turned into, a, without my consent, an anthropomorphic, you know, a hippo. And all of a sudden, I'm not getting, being fed uh, 20 tons for free every day in a zoo. Uh, so I need to rob a bank so I can, you know, pay, you know, feed myself. And she's like, well, that's silly. Why don't you just, why don't you just, uh, you know, uh, go into construction or the road, go into demolition, channel, channel all that anger into something more positive for society. And he's like, 
that's not a bad idea. But if it doesn't work out, I'm taking the bank, and I mean the whole bank. I'm not like just robbing the bank. I'm taking the physical bank. I'm just to, and anyway. So I think that's a lot better of a method. Um, you see this also in um, the Netflix series Daredevil, where he especially loves torturing people. Uh, I think maybe more than Batman, which is saying something. And it's just that you get this whole perception from the media that torture actually gets information from people. Um, there's a recent um, thing from John Oliver on his HBO show about torture and the fact that they've done um, quite long sort of like books about like the effects of torture and that it doesn't really get the information. Um, two of the cases that the FBI or the NSA, I can't remember who, basically point to and say, see, see, we got information. One of which, in one of those cases, the information that they got was completely implausible, was basically from like some sort of book or something like that about some sort of ridiculous bomb plot that would never ever work. And the other one turned out to be false. And so basically like at best you're going to get um, ridiculous information that won't help you at all, and at worst you'll get, you know, completely implausible, or what, you'll get completely false information, uh, even if it's based on real people. Um, so I think there's this sort of myth that, especially the state builds its uh, authority or power up on, see, it's like, see, we, it doesn't matter if we abuse our authority because, you know, there are terrorists out there, and if we just torture them enough, then we'll obviously get the answers we're looking for. Um, so I think that that's sort of an alternative way to look at, um, sort of the, the, the way to deal with crime. Um, for me, uh, and one of my inspirations is a, an anarchist named Voltaire Declare. Um, her way of looking at crime was very much, it's not so much about, um, it's, not, it's not so much about like the way that people are, the way that people are born or anything genealogical, it's more about social uh, factors, poverty, um, strife, um, you know, conflicts within community, conflicts between the individual and the state and stuff like that. Um, I think there's a certain extent to where um, there's like this common libertarian phrase where like you, um, you know, every day you basically break five laws that you don't know about. Um, and I think that there's a certain degree where when you eliminate the state, you're basically, um, you're much more, you're much more able to not worry about things like that, about crossing these lines that these authority figures uh, seem to think make sense. Um, and yeah, I think, I think there's just sort of a, a general, um, a lot of possibilities with going sort of the route of um, basically uh, giving sort of false perceptions of, of your organization. So there's a lot of, uh, a lot of organizations that can give sort of a certain um, perception to either the state or other forces that are sort of counter, trying to countervail them. Uh, and they're a way to sort of distort signals so it seems like and nothing is necessarily going on. Um, one thing that bothers me about the, a lot of the ways that libertarians do agorism is it's often just a way for them to personally make money. It's not a form of activism or a form of way. And it's not like there's anything wrong with not doing activism, but um, the way that Samuel Edward Conkin III talked about it with um, in the New Libertarian Manifesto, um, I think it's more of a social form of activism and there's actually ways that you could still do it as a personal project and make money off it and send that signal out to others, but on the other hand, turn that money into funding um, good community projects and activism and stuff like that, so you can kind of mix the signals there. Um, I'm glad I didn't try to do this into an hour talk because I'm already kind of trying to blanks. Um, but yeah, so on a less serious note, um, it, Squirrel Girl is like seriously an awesome comic and it's very lighthearted and funny, so I recommend everybody to, to read it. This is all like a roundabout way of just advertising for the comic because I love it so much. Um, but also intertwining with libertarians because I do think there's interesting things to, to think about even though it's a very funny, lighthearted comic. So anyway, I'm rambling at this point. Thank you. Sandra Hicks from New York City. Welcome, him to the open mic. Thank you, Jack. It's good to be here. I'll be speaking at length uh, here tomorrow at 5 o'clock on the topic of Jeb Bush. A lot of people are saying, oh, are you with the campaign? Uh, no, not with the campaign. I'm a truther, author of a couple of books about the 9-11 cover-up, and uh, done a couple of YouTube videos about the truth about Jeb Bush. Um, uh, I wanted to maybe start my little open mic time today, though, by saying something. I, had, I, I attended some of the Ayn Rand talks earlier here in this room, um, and I had like a question at the end, but they didn't call on me. But that's fine, because like, my question was really more of a speech anyway. So uh, my, 
observation, though, was I, I was going to ask the speaker from the Atlas Society, I was like, what is the objective or the objectivism of the objectivist Ayn Rand philosophy? Because he was talking about social status and keeping up with the Joneses and the importance of living by your own virtue and your own integrity. And I'm all for that. And he was against relativism. I'm all for that. But it basically boiled down to subjectivism. His talk ended with an endorsement of pursuing happiness as you define it which to me seems very relativistic or subjectivistic and not very objectivistic. You know, the, a, a, a truly objective philosophy is one in which we, we point to a new ideal. You know, and Ayn Rand even used language like that. She also seemed to borrow heavily from socialism, this idea of a strike in Atlas Shrugged, you know, being like this, a strike of the, the true creators the true producers, which would be the entrepreneurs and the capitalists, uh, which is an interesting set of ideas. Um, so my whole context to talk right now, in the moment, off the cuff here, about Jeb Bush, would be that I think a real objectivist philosophy is one in which you're not just pursuing your own happiness or your own integrity, but there has to be a level of social engagement and so anarchism and libertarianism, I think, borrow heavily from the left and from the moral imperative to, to transform society. And if we could do that without a dictatorship of the proletariat, I think then would be um, creating a really great hybrid philosophy of libertarian and left ideologies, kind of like next t-shirt, an alliance of the libertarian left, if you will. So. Uh, so I, uh, I'm happy to be here because Jack's friend John, his, his collaborator of sorts, recently did a kind of low-key confrontation of Jeb Bush. Jeb Bush has been in New Hampshire recently. It's an important state for the GOP because of the primaries. And New Hampshire tends to throw the GOP mainstream a curveball now and then. You know, remember in year 2000, George W. Bush, his campaign was gearing up, going strong, and then boom, he lost New Hampshire, right? John McCain won New Hampshire, and that was a big, that really uh, made Bush uh, fight dirty in the, for the rest of the election, uh, which is the way the Bushes fight. The Bushes are amoral, they are, um, uh, I, um, well, I, I hesitate to use the word evil, but let's just go ahead and use the word evil. They are an evil family, they've committed crimes, they have murdered people and they have gone unpunished. Um, I like to talk a lot in my books and talks about a couple of books that I read during the previous Bush administration and books that are you would do well to have a copy of and read at least a couple of chapters of. Uh, one of the books is called The Prosecution of George W. Bush for Murder by Vincent Bugliosi. Vincent Bugliosi is a former DA in Los Angeles. He prosecuted the Manson family, the Charles Manson murders, um, which some conspiracy aficionados believe were a deep state operation to shut down the 60s, to, to stop the 60s. Maybe that's too much of a conspiracy theory for you, but um, it's an interesting theory. Uh, so Bugliosi prosecuted Manson and then eventually did a book about saying, geez, George W. Bush led the country to war in Iraq under false pretenses, and that is prosecutable because it led to the death of so many young people uh, in the U.S. military and in uh, and people, you know, Iraqi nationals and citizens and women and children. So, the other book um, is a similar book. It's called the U.S. versus Bush. It's by Elizabeth De La Vega, also an attorney, former. Uh, former federal prosecutor, in which she says George W. Bush, because of his, because of his white lies, because of the way that he um, spoke around the truth and used very postmodern, subjectivist kind of uh, rubbery, uh, a rubbery sense of reality and a rubbery sense of what is actually true. Um, 
Well, that is, maybe that's common language in our postmodern society today. But when you have taken an oath to defend the Constitution, and you've taken an oath um, to, to be the President of the United States, this kind of rubbery, shading the corners, um, you know, speaking by inference or implication rather than speaking directly. So remember, George W. Bush led the country to war um, in Iraq using these insinuations, like we don't, insinuating that Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction. Um, well, what Elizabeth de la Vega says with a great moral authority in this book, U.S. versus Bush, she says that when you have uh, when you are the President of the United States, you can no longer use white lies, or lies of omission, or lies of implication, and that you are held to a higher standard. So I mentioned these two books to talk about the context in which we talk about Jeb Bush, and talk about, you know, using the word evil is obviously a pretty ambitious claim, uh, but I think I can back it up. Here are some facts that you need to know about Jeb Bush that the corporate media is not going to tell you. Jeb Bush, in his young years, in his 20s and 30s, was actually the chairman of the Dade County GOP down in Miami. Uh, while his brother, George W. Bush, wasn't as directly involved in the whole Reagan, Bush, Iran, Contra operations, Jeb Bush, on the other hand, was. And there's a very interesting book uh, called The Conspirators by a former naval intelligence veteran named Al Martin. And if you're taking notes in your head or on, on paper, Jack, this is another book you should know about, The Conspirators by Al Martin. Or just look on YouTube and look at my videos on YouTube, and I, I, hold, I hold the book up and I quote from it. Because <clears throat> there was a CIA-linked drug runner in the whole Iran-Contra operation named Barry Seal. And Barry Seal died in a, um, on U.S. soil in Louisiana, uh, was gunned down at a traffic light, and he died with the private cell phone number of George W. George Herbert Walker Bush, Papa Bush, in his trunk. So he had ties to George Herbert Walker Bush. And in The Conspirators by Al Martin, he, Al Martin had face-to-face -face conversations with young Jeb Bush while he was the Dade County GOP chairman and talked about his implications in the murder of Barry Seal. Barry Seal knew too much. He was involved in all the cocaine trafficking that the GOP and the Reagan Bush White House was engaging in to fund their illegal war um, uh, against the Sandinistas. Not to endorse the Sandinistas at the pork fest, god damn it, I would never <laughs> do such a thing. But, uh, um, uh, but still, it's, it's, it's when talking about morals and talking about integrity, the Bush family is a crime family. The, the um, <clears throat> George Herbert Walker Bush, the, 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 um, the, the president right after Reagan, the former vice president under Reagan, that guy's got so many uh, connections to criminality. Uh, I know Russ Baker, I think, is going to be here later in the week. The author of Family of Secrets, and his book is great, uh, talks about how George Herbert Walker Bush was present in Dallas in 1963 at the assassination of John F. Kennedy. You know, the, the, one of the, the, the greatest uh, coups of the shadow government against a, a, popular, a popularly elected leader here in the USA. Um, George Herbert Walker Bush was a, a, a major kingpin in the whole Iran-Contra operation, which involved not only the Sandinista, uh, the, 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 the right-wing Contra war against the Sandinistas, but it also involved the Bank of Credit and Commerce International, which helps me get to one of my favorite topics of 9-11, and we'll get there in a minute. But let's look at the shadow government financial engine, BCCI, the Bank of Credit and Commerce International. And so for any student of finance or business, this is a huge, 500 pound gorilla that most classes in finance and business don't t uh, teach you about. But it, it's really interesting because it was, originally it was like going to be this bank for the people of Pakistan, but it swiftly got co-opted by William Casey and the CIA and the Reagan White House um, because it was a way to move liquid capital quickly around the globe. 
in order to do the, the, the operations that the shadow government wanted to do. Um, and we know with Bitcoin, we see how important it is to like move, be able to move money uh, swiftly around the globe. Well, this was kind of the, the shadow government's Bitcoin. And effectively, it helped create a relationship between the CIA and so-called radical Islam. And it was that relationship that helped us to create the whole 9-11 event. The whole 9-11 event was an, an incredible hoax based on a racist assumption that the Islamists are crazy and the Islamists uh, are, are, are willing to attack uh, the USA and are, are bloodthirsty and are willing to do anything to bring uh, the US state down. Uh, when really the facts are that in the history of architecture, no steel frame structure has ever collapsed due to fire. And that was a huge architectural engineering anomaly that's illogical and it's, it's, it's asking the American people to think based on emotions and on racism rather than on science and logic, right? Because usually a steel frame structure will burn for 48 hours and only the steel remains. Steel is like that. It's tough, it's tensile, it's, it, it doesn't melt, it doesn't give uh, based on carbon-based fires, jet fuel or office fires. So, um, so this goes back to the criminality of the Bush-Cheney White House. They appointed their commission that controlled the official investigation. Uh, that official investigation did not look at certain key anomalies, like how did Building 7, which fell at 5.20 p.m. later that day, fall at free fall rate of acceleration into its own footprint? How did Buildings 1 and 2 fall at free fall rate of acceleration into their own footprints? Uh, and what effect effectively happened? Um, I think the, the, the key story of 9-11 is really the, the, the criminality of the Bush family. The, the pre-planned attack on Iraq, the attack on Afghanistan, the, the colonial expansion of the U.S. shadow government, the oil companies, um, this, this basically uh, agreed unfettered by the collapse of the Soviet Empire. You know, the U.S. war state no longer has a major rival that will restrain it. The only thing that restrains it is we the people. But if we the people have been brainwashed into uh, an emotional acquiescence to wars of aggression, then uh, there's really nothing stopping the shadow state, the, 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 the dark state. So that's what Jeb Bush represents. Jeb Bush represents that family, that politics. It's not libertarian, it's not true conservative, it's certainly not Christian. You know, he's sort of an anomaly. You know, he's a convert to Catholicism. He married uh, a Colombian woman. Um, and uh, um, his, his racist father referred to his kids as the little brown ones at one point and then had to like recant and uh, apologize for that. So um, I, I admire Jeb Bush because he didn't go to Yale and he didn't join the Skull and Bones uh, demonic fraternity homoerotic, like, you know, uh, uh, there's some sort of weird thing, you lie naked in a coffin and you confess your secrets to your brothers and the skull and bones fraternity, I don't know if that's like part of like control, you know, the, all these guys on the 9-11 commission have a control file, you know, they've done stuff or they've been, uh, they've done stuff that allows other people to control them, that's, uh, and part of that might be, you know, um, would you like to come to a party with underage girls and boys and there's stuff happening in the back room and oh there happens to be video cameras there because that's the control file that's how some of the, the, the politics that's how some of this deep uh, dark uh, deep state politics happens in our in our in our day and age and it's gross and it's amoral but that is the kind of demonic energy that we're dealing with so um, how am I for time Jack you're, you're filling um very well. <laughs> <laughs> Killing time. So I'm going to be speaking at length about the, these topics at 5 p.m. tomorrow. I know our friends from the, uh, the from Virginia might want to like take the next slot on the open mic. All right. Uh, you guys are on deck. Any questions before I wrap up? Yes. What is your name and the name of your books? Okay, great. Thank you. My name is Sander Hicks. S a n d e r h i c k s dot com is my website so sanderhicks.com 
I wrote a book in, uh, I wrote a book called The Big Wedding, 9-11, The Whistleblowers and the Cover-Up, one of the first 9-11 truth books. I have a couple copies here in the back. And uh, I also wrote a book called Slingshot to the Juggernaut, uh, and that's more recent. But I don't have that one here, so I won't talk about that. And uh, SanderHicks.com, uh, friend me on Facebook, I'll be your friend. <laughs> and by the way, in Slingshot, you, we had just met, and you mentioned the Free State Project, I think, so. That's right. Yeah. That's right, because I think we had met in Boston at a major New England. Yeah. Right, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So. Thanks, Sam. Hi, uh, my name is Josiah. I'm from Virginia, uh, which is a great state uh, south of the Mason Dixon line. We like it down there. Uh, and uh, that's Mike back there who didn't want to get up and talk because he makes me do all that. Um, I guess I'll just uh, put in a shameless plug for what we're doing on Thursday, uh, Thursday at 4 o'clock uh, in the pavilion. Uh, we're going to be talking about how to elect liberty candidates to uh, get the right people in office, get the wrong people out of office, and, uh, you know, win or lose, have a little fun in the process, and um, cause a lot of political pain for bad politicians. Uh, they don't like spending money, they don't like being called out on the records, uh, and it's, it's a lot of fun to do that, and sometimes you win, and that's even better, so. Um, and then you can get bills carried, and you can get stuff voted for, and, um, you know, the government being what it is, you can only do so much, but, uh, <coughs> Um, we do a whole lot more, uh, a lot than uh, zero. So, um, so we, uh, that's mainly what we do is um, we run campaigns uh, for people that we identify as, as liberty minded. Uh, who say that basically people that I would gladly volunteer for because of what they believe um, and that they want to, um, like they say, the, the grand libertarian conspiracy, take over the world and leave everybody alone. Those are the kind of uh, people that, that I like to help get elected. Um, and, you know, obviously they, they always have an uphill battle. They're normally challenging an incumbent. They're normally underfunded. Uh, they don't have any organization because they're libertarians that don't have any organization. Um, and, and so um, we try to come alongside and basically take a candidate who would be considered unviable, a waste of time, and make them viable uh, and make them worth people's time investing in both volunteering um, you know, financial investing in their campaigns. So we just try to give them a shot for what that's worth. Um, but we'll, we'll just be talking about some tics, uh, tips and tricks, some stuff that we've learned, um, trying to share some um, ways and means of, of uh, getting a little farther in the uh, electoral battles with statists. Um, and that will be Thursday in the pavilion at 4 o'clock. So I'd love to see any all of you there. Um, and what else do you want to talk about? Um, okay, so uh, normally campaigns are extraordinarily inefficient. Uh, imagine that, the common status bastards that uh, um, are in the government have campaigns that tend to mirror the way government works. It wastes money, it wastes resources. And um, so what we've done is we've kind of found a way to, to kind of mirror how the free market works. Um, and so we're able to do a whole lot more with a whole lot less and uh, um, find success. Um, through innovation and through uh, making our resources um, more effective and more efficient and um, have a lot of fun causing pain to bad people um, in the meantime. So, uh, Can I have a speech? It's, uh, it's, it's, it's a fun thing to do and um, it's, uh, it's amazing what happens when you um, actually take a free market approach to, to campaigns and elections. And uh, a lot of times you can be successful doing that and expand the way you're doing it. So it's a good time. So yeah, come hang out with us. Uh, kind of. Personally, I'm kind of stoked that we get to speak at Fort Fest. This is kind of like a dream come true. And I'm looking forward to doing it. It's going to be 4 o'clock over there in the pavilion. Um, on Thursday? On Thursday, yeah. I think somebody made a mistake, uh, mistake and looked just for the big stage, and we're going to take advantage of every second. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, guys. Um, well, real quick, yeah, <coughs> sit down. Just so you know, um, Mike accidentally got himself elected to a position in Virginia uh, by writing um, completely, completely unintentional. It, it wasn't my fault. Um, so, Mike is actually a, an elected Soil and Water Conservation Board Director, uh, which, yes, they have a board just for conserving soil and water, who knew? I the heck? All the things. Yeah, so, um, so he's um, actively voting against giving millions of dollars in taxpayer money to people who, to, in order to build fences, in order to comply with point source pollution mandates from the EPA. 
Um, I think that's basically the quick summary of what, what you do is you vote against all that. So, uh, <laughs> so that's great. And I, I managed to get myself sentenced to my county planning commission, so I'm uh, posing as a local land use tyrant while actually not being one. Um, and they're starting to catch up. The county attorney said I was a libertarian the other day, so they figured me out. Um, <laughs> so basically, we, we are finding different ways to uh, take over the system from within. And you know, the fact of the matter is, if you completely withdraw from the system, um, the only people that are going to be uh, empowered by the system are the wrong people. Um, and you know, there's an argument to be made for withdrawing and basically allowing it to collapse under its own weight. Um, and that has a lot of, I don't know, I, I think that's, that's a fair uh, argument to make, but uh, I tend to not like to just sit by and wait for things to collapse. I like to um, go in there and actually help them collapse from the inside. So that's what, that's what we do, and uh, it's a lot of fun. So thanks, y'all, for the time. Thank you. Uh, my name is Morten. I'm from Norway. Um, I would just like to tell you something about Norway because probably you don't know much about Norway from before. Maybe you do, but maybe you don't. Uh, one thing about Norway is that they have the biggest welfare state in the world, um, I think. Um, and uh, what I would like to tell you, and you're not even going to believe it, but if you, if you are sick at work, even if it's psychologically a problem or anything, um, then you get a year full salary for staying at home being sick. One year, 12 months. And this system is uh, really working very well as far as people are honest. And that's a good thing I have to say about Norway, that people are very honest. They are, they are not generally misusing the system. But what I see is that this, this honestness is declining. So what I see is that people are misusing the system more and more. And one year of full salary for being sick. That's, the idea is very nice. The idea behind it is very nice, it's, it's about uh, loving people even if they are not able to work. But just imagine how much it can be misused. And I see, my personal opinion is that the system is misused more and more. And as you know guys, uh, gentlemen and gentlewomen, you know that the oil price is now gone down from $110 a barrel to about uh, 60 and oil is uh, what funds our whole uh, system. I think that Norway will have a big problem if they want to keep up the welfare state as it is right now in the future. That's my opinion. Thank you for listening. Dude, dot com.